let's begin the meeting then. And I want to welcome everybody to this, our October monthly Lighter Footprints meeting. I'm Carolyn Ingerson, the founder and former convener of Lighter Footprints. And I'd like to begin by acknowledging that wherever you are in Australia, you are on Aboriginal land that was never ceded. I am on Wurundjeri country and we pay our respects to First Nations elders, past, present and emerging, and to any First Nations people joining us here tonight. Now, had it not been for the impact of COVID on our capacity to be out and about, we would have been meeting in the Hawthorne Town Hall tonight, where you were booked. And the hundreds of you who were sitting at home safely would have been packed in together in the way that we've done in past years. We would have felt the power of those personal faces and voices and clapping hands, which sadly you can only imagine tonight. Because of our special guests and the large audience, we've chosen to use a webinar, which means that our usual Zoom capacity to at least see each other is not possible tonight. However, you have got means of communication and you want to, you, you're welcome to use them. Somewhere in our audience, I'd like to welcome three of our local members of parliament. Paul Hamer, member for Box Hill, Will Fowles, member for Burwood, and John Kennedy, member for Hawthorne. And I'm sure there are others worthy of special mention, along with all our attendees, whom we warmly welcome here tonight. There are some other webinar features you will need to be aware of in order to contribute as an audience tonight. So to take you through these, let me hand over to our co-convener, Mick Nolan, who will take you through these and introduce our guests. I'm looking forward to a terrific night and I hope you are too. Over to you, Mick. Thank you, Carolyn. Good evening, everyone. I'm Mick Nolan and I'm a co-convener along with Lynn Franks, a lot of footprints. Welcome to our big event this year titled Going It Alone, What States Can Do for Climate Action. Thank you so much for joining us this evening. Just a few tips to help make this event more interactive. If you hover, over, hover your mouse over the bottom of your screen, you should be able to see both a Q&A button to the uh, I think it's to the left and also a, uh, a chat button to the right. So this is a feature of Zoom webinars. If you, like me, haven't spent a lot of time on Zoom webinar, but on standard Zoom, the Q&A button is, 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 is a new button to, uh, or specific to Zoom webinars. Uh, you can put your name and country you are on into the chat. Some people have already done that. Fantastic. If you have relevant comments you want to make, that the chat's the place to do that. Our guests will be answering questions from the audience later on. Uh, if you have a question, please enter it into the Q&A, the Q&A, the one with the two voice clouds. Please ensure you keep chat and questions relevant and respectful, as always. Thank you. As well as putting in your own questions, you can also like a question which upvotes that question. So click on the thumbs up icon below the question that you like, and it's a sort of a voting system. So the more thumbs up, the higher the question goes in the ranking on the Q&A. And finally, a reminder that we are recording this event. You will get a link to the recording in a post event email tomorrow. All going well. Now, let me introduce our three guests tonight. Uh, Light of Footprints is excited to have the Honourable Lily D'Ambrosio, Minister for Energy, Environment and Climate Change speaking this evening. Minister D'Ambrosio was elected into parliament in 2002 and was appointed the Minister for Industry and Minister for Energy and Resources in 2014. In 2016, she became Minister for Energy, Environment and Climate Change and later also the Minister for Solar Homes. Minister D'Ambrosio is a public leader in climate change action, renewable energy and energy efficiency in fact, across Australia. She is uh, a leader in that area, obviously a um, member of the Victorian government. 
She oversaw the passage of the Climate Change Act in 2017, four years ago, Victoria's landmark climate legislation. We also have tonight Simon Holmes a court. He is one of Australia's leading energy commentators and analysts. He was a founding director of Hepburn Wind, which built Australia's first community owned wind farm. Simon is currently a senior advisor at the Energy Transition Hub at Melbourne University. He also sits on the board of the Smart Energy Council. We're extremely pleased to have Simon join us tonight. We're really looking forward to having his input to the discussion. Thank you, Simon. Victoria Mackenzie McCarg will be our panel moderator. Victoria is the Strategic Director of Women's Environmental Leadership Australia, an organisation which fosters and empowers women leaders in the environment movement. She is an experienced leader, campaigner and network builder, having spent the last 15 years in a variety of climate campaign leadership positions at the Australian Conservation Foundation, Environment Victoria, Bank Australia, as well as several years as the chair of the Climate Action Network of Australia, or CANA. Okay, the formal part of the evening will be conducted in three parts. Firstly, Minister D'Ambrosio will outline Victorian achievements and ambitions on climate and key impacts of a number of federal areas where there is little ambition. After the Minister's talk, Victoria will then host a panel conversation with the Minister and Simon. At appropriate times, Victoria will take questions that you, the audience, have submitted into the Q&A uh, as we spoke about earlier. These questions will be posed to the Minister with a chance also for Simon to offer perspective, his perspective on some of these questions and answers. And now, please welcome our Minister for Energy, Environment and Climate Change, the Honourable Lily D'Ambrosio. Thank you, Minister. Thank you very much, Mick, and Lily will certainly do. Uh, so I'm very happy to, to answer to that. Uh, can I uh, thank you very much uh, for that introduction? Uh, I do want to begin by uh, my acknowledgements to the uh, traditional owners of the land on which uh, I am gathered and I'm gathered on the land of the, the lands of the Wurundjeri people. Uh, and my respects certainly go to all of them, past, present uh, and emerging, any who may be here amongst us today. And of course, all of uh, uh, all communities right across uh, the reach of this uh, webinar, my acknowledgement and respect uh, go to all of you. Uh, and I also want to acknowledge uh, John Kennedy, uh, Will Fowles, I won't mention your titles because that's already been done, Paul Hamer. I, I will though, I believe that Nina Taylor is here, who's the upper house, I think she's just jumped in, uh, the upper house member for Southern Metro Region. Um, to Carolyn, uh, it's really great to be in your company again. Uh, would have been nice to be at the town hall, but there you have it. Let's let's look towards next year, hopefully. Uh, and then, of course, Victoria, uh, really pleased to be with you again. Uh, to Simon, uh, it's been a little while, but uh, I'm hoping you're well, and it's good to share this platform with you also, and to, to Lynn. Uh, and thank you very much for your introduction and your invitation. Uh, I'm always very uh, pleased to get invitations from uh, this fantastic organisations because you very much are uh, uh, an organisation that has you know hundreds and hundreds of people who follow you and engage and have really meaningful and deep conversations about uh, the state of our planet. Uh, but what does local action look like? What should it look like? And what more can we do to uh, share? Um, the, the good word about uh, action that needs to uh, occur, whether it's very much as individuals or within our community or indeed at uh, state level, uh, Commonwealth level, and of course, uh, globally. Uh, and certainly I'm very pleased, of course, to have the opportunity to remind people of some of the uh, very important uh, milestones that uh, we set about uh, achieving as a Victorian government. And I'm really pleased that uh, uh, that that has also enabled uh, other jurisdictions to look towards strengthening their own commitments uh, in uh, climate uh, action. Uh, and uh, I'm very uh, confident that and very proud that uh, we are, if we were a, if we were a national government uh, as a state, 
um, the effort that, that, that we've been able to achieve, uh, the very ambitious nature of the reforms that we've introduced in the last few years that we've been in government uh, would be one that would be applauded uh, globally. But we're not a national government. Uh, we will continue, of course, to do uh, everything we can uh, as a state leader. Uh, and our absolute commi uh, commitment is, of course, to achieve uh, not just net zero emissions uh, by 2050. That, that was something that we settled uh, four or five years ago. Uh, of course, what we settled uh, earlier this year was a commitment uh, to halve our emissions by 2030. Uh, and that is uh, really important because we know, of course, that uh, with the evolving science and uh, an update of science that the window for strong action uh, to, uh, to give us the, the best fighting chance that we could possibly have to uh, stay well below two degrees and as close to one and a half degrees as, as possible in terms of increased warming uh, is getting smaller and smaller. Uh, and there is absolutely no excuse uh, for not taking action. Certainly no excuse from uh, so-called advanced countries that have got very strong democracies, that have got you know, wealth uh, compared to many other countries. Uh, and, uh, and that leadership is absolutely uh, a very red hot button issue uh, with a very strong spotlight on Australia uh, from uh, that global, uh, from, from global players. Uh, just as a reminder, uh, with, to back our commitment uh, for net zero emissions, uh, we were one of the first jurisdictions globally to uh, establish legislation. Uh, with that legislative commitment uh, in there. Uh, but we went further than that. We actually uh, uh, required of the Victorian government uh, to establish interim emissions reduction targets uh, in five yearly tranches. And hence uh, our announcement back in March uh, for a target for 2025 and then the target for uh, 2030. And that enables uh, us as a government uh, and, and, and the economy, communities that live with, and, and communities and the economy, the industry, businesses, uh, the discipline uh, that we need, that we believe interim targets must play and can only really help deliver that discipline uh, to actually move uh, now, take strong action now and not just wait for a perfect time to move and uh, meanwhile, we get closer and closer to 2050 and further and further away to be able to not just arrest the problem, but actually make some uh, tangible uh, improvements uh, to global warming, uh, which our community uh, expects of us. So we released that. Sorry, it was in May, not March. I apologise. We also uh, released the uh, Victorian uh, Climate Change Strategy back then. Uh, and, uh, and then, of course, uh, people will have had an opportunity, I think, to, to read that document. And that really is about uh, some early actions uh, and, of course, more needs to be built uh, on that. Uh, we were also active in the Under Two Coalition as one of the first participants uh, to sign up to, to that coalition going back four years ago. And that uh, is a, a group of subnational governments globally that are committed to ambitious climate action in line with the Paris uh, Agreement. Uh, and we're sharing uh, knowledge, we're sharing experiences with regional governments uh, around the world who, like us, are pursuing uh, ambitious targets to combat climate change. Uh, so we were really keen to ensure that we had a, a whole of economy, whole of system approach to tackling climate change. Uh, because that gives us the best uh, chance to actually meet the objectives that the world uh, uh, needs, uh, that the world expects of all of us, uh, and again, through that discipline. Now, today, of course, uh, the need for action is even more acute, as I touched on earlier with the, the latest science. Uh, and uh, we know, of course, that Victoria's climate uh, has warmed by 1.2 degrees Celsius since reliable records began in 1910. So uh, in, in 110, 111 years, uh, we've gone up by 1.2 uh, degrees Celsius. And we're seeing reduced rainfall across the state, more bushfire danger days and longer bushfire season overall. We're also seeing very, um, uh, uh, very, very uh, significant storm events. The likes, and, and if we only have to look at what happened in the Daniel Ranges and also in the Macedon region uh, back uh, in, I think it was June, 
I think it was June or, or July, where uh, they were the worst that we'd actually seen in, in probably ever uh, in terms of the impact. Uh, and uh, But we know, of course, that uh, the, uh, the commitments that we've made in terms of our uh, targets, our, our, the variety of uh, policies and programs that we've uh, been rolling out really do place us very squarely alongside uh, the aspirations of many global leaders. And, and I don't say this because, you know, it's about putting tickets on, on us, but, you know, the consequences and the impact that we can all have, whether that we are a local government, whether we are a subnational government as a state, uh, or indeed a national government, setting our own strong ambition uh, does align us uh, squarely and contributes uh, to that global effort. Uh, so uh, unashamedly, you know, uh, I'm, I'm really uh, clear about the fact that we're up there with Germany, we're up there with California in terms of our uh, interim targets for 2030. Uh, and of course, <clears throat> a number of countries have sort of made even more commitments uh, po uh, since, uh, we, uh, since we made, announced our targets uh, going back to May. Now, in terms of what we've already achieved, we've already cut our emissions by almost 25% compared to, uh, uh, based on 2005 levels. Um, so we've not only beat our 2020 emissions targets, uh, but we've done that two years earlier. Of course, a lot more has to be done. We can't rest on that. Uh, and the strategy uh, that we released in May uh, provides some of the details of those next efforts that we will roll out uh, to get us uh, closer towards our 2030 target. But of course, with each budget year that comes around in government, we will need to add, uh, uh, we will need to, I will be using that as an opportunity to continue to add to our effort to achieve uh, those targets. Uh, so um, in terms of, um, uh, the other benefits, of course, and this has been, uh, you know, finally, a, a Commonwealth government has actually admitted it, uh, that there is an absolute link between uh, strong action on climate uh, and uh, the jobs creation opportunities, investment opportunities, uh, and the broader well-being, health and well-being uh, of, of, of all of us uh, as, a, as a society. Um, now, yes, it's, it's uh, years too late. Uh, but it's acknowledged, but I do want to say that they shouldn't be congratulated for that. The, that was, the, the, if they do land on a 20, uh, on a 2050 net zero emissions target, that does not deserve applause. That was an answer to a question that was needed five years ago. What I want to know and what all you want to know is what are they going to do between now and 2030? Okay, that's, that's the real question here. So, um, Whilst we all want to see them move, uh, we should not be uh, satisfied uh, or give a leave pass for feeble, feeble um, indications of, of effort. Uh, and, uh, and, and we can hear that globally, the leaders are saying, well, yeah, sure, net zero by 2050, but what's your target for 2030? So it's not just us saying that, we know that. So, um, in terms of um, unpacking some of the uh, the things that we have done, uh, we know and people are very, very familiar with a lot of our efforts around energy and the decarbonisation uh, agenda there has been very strong, very, very ambitious uh, from a state that has been uh, heavily reliant um, on the most polluting form of uh, energy generation, and that is generation uh, utilising brown coal uh, reserves in Victoria. Uh, and uh, so I'm not saying that we need an applause for that, but I do want to indicate that uh, the degree of change that we've been able to achieve in just six years, uh, I think needs to be seen in the context of where we started. Uh, and the fact is that the more we do the, the, uh, in terms of changing over our energy supply uh, mix, uh, we can get big licks of emissions reductions because we're substituting uh, amongst the heaviest polluting form of uh, energy generation, brown coal. Uh, 
uh, much uh, dirtier in terms of emissions than black coal uh, and, and substituting with clean energy. Uh, so, um, so we've uh, certainly set very strong renewable energy targets. People are familiar with those. You're familiar with our 25% target by 2020. Uh, earlier this year, we clocked, clocked up around about 30 uh, 30 percent uh, and we certainly overshot the 25 percent back in uh, back last year and uh, we're very much on track uh, to meet our 50 percent renewable energy target by 2030. Now we'll keep uh, uh, looking at opportunities to to grow that I'm, I'm not here to make any uh, announcements or commitments uh, but we want to go as as hard as we possibly can knowing all the while that between uh, now and 2030 uh, to achieve that target, we will have created more than 24,000 jobs in Victoria, most of which are in regional Victoria. The other important part of this is that uh, we, we've uh, helped to uh, stimulate uh, and lead by example as a government by supporting, uh, uh, well, by, by uh, adopting a, a, a uh, a V-RED uh, auction, if you like. So we did the first one back in 2017. The second one is out there now for the market to respond to, and it's looking really, really strong and favourable. And the importance of that, if I may say, is of course showing leadership, but utilising the government's own purchasing power and contracting power to require local content. A lot of projects that are built out there without government support or if they do have government support, are not actually putting much store in requiring or extracting local supply uh, improvements uh, because you then get a multiplying effect in the jobs. You get a multiply. You get a, an added benefit in terms of growing a, a, a better ecosystem in terms of energy services, skills, and the like. And that is a distinct advantage for us as a government uh, when we're delivering our renewable energy target. Uh, we're requiring minimum local content uh, in our tenders. Uh, and that is absolutely supporting um, businesses like Keppel Prince, you know, uh, which, you know, struggles. Uh, I, I think they're, they're, they're fair to say because they, they rely very much so on uh, businesses to uh, seek um, uh, product from them in, in a global market, which is very much weighted against uh, them uh, because of the origins of a lot of uh, a lot of uh, materials. But um, but but that that is about growing an ecosystem here in Victoria, uh, and we've already seen a lot of investment in training facilities by some of these businesses. Um, we've got a nacelle assembly. Uh, uh, plant over in Geelong at the Ford factory that's, you know, actually creating again more jobs, the first time in a number of years that we've had that type of facility in the country, and that's on the back of our VRE auctions. Uh, significant investments too uh, have been made even just from the 2021 uh, state budget, $1.6 billion, and that's a, a, to, to deal with the whole suite of um, reforms, uh, including um, more than half a billion dollars to establish an, our six uh, new renewable uh, energy zones. Uh, and, uh, and that's the single largest investment in grid infrastructure uh, of any of the states. And in fact, more so than what New South Wales and Queensland combined have, have put aside for it. We need it, it, it you know, there's lots of challenges uh, with our uh, transmission uh, infrastructure. It, that's a challenge, not just for Victoria, uh, but it needs to be dealt with. Uh, those zones uh, go right across our, our state and uh, the plan is to harness uh, around 10 gigawatts of new renewable energy supply uh, from that uh, effort. Uh, we've also, of course, made um, some significant uh, uh, commitments uh, around uh, transport. And I know that there's uh, an expectation for a lot more to be done in that area in terms of reduced emissions. and. Uh, I'm really clear uh, that more will be done. Our government has made it uh, a very clear priority uh, on that front. But as, as a starter, uh, we do have a rebate scheme out there uh, to help um, uh, Victorians uh, access or, or choose a ZEV vehicle as opposed to an internal combustion engine. Uh, uh, and of course, Minister Carroll is rolling out uh, even just the other day, made some really good announcements on uh, electric vehicles in terms of electric buses, uh, the fleet. So collectively, that's we're putting aside about $100 million worth of effort. Uh, and I do want to say, though, that that is really just the first tranche. We've got 
uh, an expert panel that is uh, doing some work to produce uh, further recommendations to us to, to up our effort uh, in terms of, excuse me, transport emissions reductions for 2030, because we have also announced uh, that by 2030, we wanna see half of all new light vehicle passenger cars, uh, sorry, light vehicle uh, car, um, passenger cars, sorry, uh, sold uh, in Victoria. Um, so there needs to be a massive uh, step change uh, in that. This is one area where concerted federal government effort would go such a long way for all states because there are a number of levers uh, uh, that are available to the Commonwealth government that are not available uh, to states. It's a very difficult area. We don't have a full suite of levers that control uh, the standards of cars that come into the country. Uh, you know, we've, we've still got a report sitting on some federal government shelf uh, uh, that looked into uh, improving um, the uh, vehicle emission standards uh, that go, I think they've been sitting on a shelf since 2016, and that needs to be dusted off and, and implemented. Um, and this is about bringing those prices down for people to be able to afford these, uh, to make the switch. Um, in terms of uh, uh, other measures, energy efficiency is a really critical, and I've got an eye on the clock and I will wrap up very soon. Energy efficiency is a really big uh, saver uh, in terms of, uh, uh, reduced emissions uh, and we've increased uh, our funding uh, in uh, energy efficiency from that one and a half 1.6 billion dollar investment uh, we've got uh, significant uh, money for business recovery energy efficiency fund uh, we've got um, the swap out of uh, old inefficient uh, heating systems many of which are gas uh, with uh, more than 200,000 uh, rebates for uh, new split system air cons and heating systems uh, for the lower income uh, Victorians. Massive program, massive program that will make a massive difference to, to uh, climate change, but also the health of uh, people uh, who, uh, many of whom live in very um, poorly uh, insulated uh, homes. Uh, our solar uh, Victoria program uh, is really a fantastic example of how you actually make the whole climate change uh, program uh, and task really, really tangible to everybody. Uh, whether you're a renter, uh, whether you're uh, a landholder, a, a, a homeowner, uh, you're able to access and providing you, you earn under $180,000 a year, which is probably eight out of 10 uh, Victorians uh, households, uh, $180,000 a year that you you can get significant rebates of solar systems and, and also uh, batteries and the like. And the evidence in terms of that pickup is just fantastic. It's just, uh, uh, I think we've uh, achieved uh, over 150,000 installations um, up to date, up, up to now. Look, many other things, we've also put in some money, uh, uh, about $100 million for natural environment cutting emissions. Uh, uh, including $77 million for nature restoration for carbon storage, bush bank program. Uh, there's been also $35 million for the agriculture sector uh, for research and technology so that for farmers, but also of course some money for them to plant more trees on their own land. Uh, and, uh, and again, as I said, there's more that needs to be done. The, the, there are two big areas of reform uh, that uh, other than what I've already indicated will come with further transport announcements. Uh, that uh, 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 that need to be uh, sorted, uh, and uh, and they are of course, what do we do about natural gas? Uh, how do we decarbonise uh, the gas sector? Really big challenge, especially in Victoria. People, some of you will know, many of you may know that uh, Victoria is the most heavily reliant in terms of domestic use of gas. Of, of all of the states. Uh, and, and that's historical, uh, you know, because we've had the, the best Australian um, uh, oil and gas fields providing, you know, gas, plenty, plenty of gas over many, many decades. And also, of course, combined with our very cold winters, our reliance uh, is really, really deeply uh, ingrained. Uh, and of course, is, is we've got the, the most extensive reticulated gas network uh, in the country. Uh, which means that the challenge is big for us, bigger than some other states. Uh, but nevertheless, you know, if you're not dealing with the challenges, then you're actually not dealing with climate change. So uh, we're, uh, I've 
developing a, a gas substitution roadmap. Uh, and there are about three or four prongs to that, and there, more will be said on that uh, in the coming uh, months. One is uh, an, increase, an increasing reliance that we should put on electrification, a great reliance on uh, energy efficiency. Uh, and, uh, and then, of course, there is uh, uh, what do we do in place? What, is there another type of gas other than natural gas? So what is the role of renewable hydrogen in that? What is the role of uh, biomethane, uh, uh, for example? And there's a lot of really concerted effort there on that because that is the next big nut that needs to be cracked uh, for solutions. Uh, and of course, um, uh, we're very uh, committed to uh, offshore wind uh, as a really important resource. Victoria has the best offshore wind resource in the country, amongst the best in the world. Uh, people will be familiar with a number of proponents that have been uh, have indicated uh, a keenness uh, to go forward with uh, some projects and uh, we've got some tenders out at the moment for support for a range of uh, innovative uh, energy technologies including wind offshore wind including uh, renewable hydrogen uh, that will be in a position to make some announcements on uh, in the not too distant future as, as I would put it. Now, I know I've gone for a long time. I will stop there. And I do apologize for chewing up a lot of time, but I believe we've got a bit of time on the clock still. Thank you. Thank you very much, Minister. Um, I'm sure you can imagine the applause from the crowd. It, um, really appreciate you being here with us today. Uh, and hello to the audience. I'm Victoria mackenzie McCarg. I'll be facilitating the discussion here today. I'm the Strategic Director of Women's Environmental Leadership Australia uh, and really pleased to be a long-term friend of Lighter Footprints and engaged with many of these events. Um, I also just want to acknowledge that I'm joining the conversation today from the land of the Gadabanud and the Gulagin people in southwest Victoria in the Otway Ranges and pay my respects to elders past and present. I also want to acknowledge, um, as I have just declared, I'm from regional Victoria and, of course, solidarity from regional Victoria to Melbourne, but I really want to acknowledge the enormous uh, resilience of so many of you in Melbourne on the call here today. Um, I'm, I'm sure we're all internally jumping for joy at the opportunities to be out and about with our friends and family. Um, but I just want to acknowledge that, that this, this Zoom is at the end of a long line of them. I'm sure you've been joining over many, many months. So thank you for coming to us again today uh, and for your efforts in that. I think this has in some ways been a bit of a trial run for some of the resilience we're going to need to show as the impacts of climate and biodiversity crises are felt across our communities and so the links in communities that we're making and the new ways of thinking about things and, and operating uh, is hopefully something we've all been learning from throughout this whole process. Uh, but Minister, over to you and, and to just drill in a little bit further. Thank you so much for your presentation. Um, as was mentioned earlier, I've been around the climate debate quite a lot over the last 15 years, and it has been really encouraging to see the Victorian government really shift and, and move forward quite significantly in the last few years. What, I mean, you've listed, listed quite a number of achievements and, and, and policy outcomes that the government has taken forward. What would you see as your biggest success in this space thus far? You personally. Oh, gee. <laughs> All right. Uh, I suppose as, as, a, as a broad uh, um, uh, matter, I would say um, the, the, the journey that all Victorians have taken as a community to not just understand and accept uh, the challenge of climate change, but the absolute embrace that they've taken to uh, doing something concrete about it. Uh, and not losing hope. I think if I can add that extra one in there, it's really important because we have to act with hope. That is really critical. And I think uh, we've been able to do that in Victoria quite successfully where people can understand, yes, this can happen. Um, and yes, I can get some good things too. I don't have to worry and, and stress that I'm somehow gonna get left out of this equation because I can't afford to participate. That's not to say that there aren't any localised impacts. Uh, for example, the early retirement closure of uh, your lawn that we were able to negotiate with Energy Australia has its impacts likely, of course. Uh, but uh, even uh, commentary from that community, they know that this is coming. Uh, and it's about what do we do instead of those technologies now? And that's really important to articulate that. Thank you. 
sorry, that was a lot in there, but it's no. generally about community, the whole of the state coming together to get this done. It's a really interesting reflection, um, particularly this week, as one large part of our community, being our federal government, is not really coming together on this issue. Uh, and we've seen some really, I mean, I've got to say, watching this and hearing commentary around, well, we've only had 36 hours to look at a policy. I mean, the rest of the country has been discussing this for a decade, so I'm not quite sure how <laughs> one group of people have only been talking about it for 36 hours. But it, it is concerning to think about, well, we've got a part of the community ready to go, but there's there's a really big part of, of the leadership of our federal community, our national community, that's not ready to go. What, what impact does that lack of action from the federal government have on how far states and how fast states can progress this sort of action? Absolutely. And, and I'm a, a, a significant amount. I mean, what states do is not an excuse for any of us to let the Commonwealth off the hook. None. Okay. And I mentioned earlier what we could do in transport. And states are, do have some uh, limitations in terms of, we can do a lot of things, you know, a lot of things, but in terms of the suite of actions, because you can't just solve one problem with, you know, if, if you've got a, a wider uh, um, number of tools in your toolkit, you're gonna do a better job, right? If you've got a narrow, if, if all you've got is a Phillips head and, a, and whatever the other one's called, you know, it's, it's, it's very limiting in what the renovation is that you need to do to your house, okay? Putting in those terms. So, um, so that's really, uh, really, really critical. So transport is an absolute one. Uh, agriculture is one where uh, there needs to be a lot of investment, I think, in research and development. Now, of course, states are doing that, but we need that extra effort to come in over it. And ultimately, um, the, the, the drag that occurs on investor confidence as much as states can be really strong and vocal um, about their own actions, if, if we actually start to, sh to lift the threshold of, of acceptance on the need for some type of action, you need to start to move the debate even further about, well, it's not about whether or not we do something, it's about how far can we go? What are the options that we should adopt to be able to get to X. Uh, and, and that's where we're not at the moment. We're still arguing about whether we do or don't. Uh, and, and that is just a drag on uh, where collectively as, as a country we can actually be at. Uh, we should very much be not just, you know, we, we, the effort uh, achieved over by, by 2030 could be much greater with Commonwealth effort. I mean, what's your thoughts on this? Because we're about to head into the COP26 negotiations in Glasgow. This is like where the world gets together and decides, will we, won't we, how far, how fast? And the Australian government is lagging and is clearly not going to be taking through the sorts of ambitions that we need to see. What kind of impact do you see that happening in the global space when countries like Australia aren't stepping up? But also, how, how are you seeing that play out with the state action that's happening internally as well? Yeah. Well, look, uh, I, th I think you've got a, a, a glow that is very um, incredulous as to why Australia still has this inability to resolve a question that the rest, you know, most of the rest of the world uh, uh, resolved a number of years ago. It must be a real mystery, uh, and but one uh, that uh, is being met uh, by bemusement to say the least, uh, because there is, you know, if it's if it's hard for a country like Australia, how you know how much harder can it be for someone else that is actually probably uh, less wealthy but still actually committed to doing taking strong action. Um, we're not playing, we are not a good global citizen when we take the position and continue to take the position that we are. And I think the rest of the world would see Australia as a very poor global citizen. And in so terms I mean, of states, well, it, states don't really resonate, unfortunately, at a global level. I mean, we do have, of course, a lot of uh, involvement uh, in uh, uh, subnational uh, forums around COP Glasgow, uh, as we did with Paris as, uh, uh, as a state. But the thing is that the downside is that global investors who may not be familiar with state efforts think Australia not a good place to invest. 
whereas if they understood the subnational regimes and those that have engagement with us know it, they know Victoria is a great place to invest because they know they've got very supportive, uh, very supportive policies and programs uh, that facilitate their investment coming into the state. Mm. Simon, what's your response and thoughts on this on this topic? Thanks, Victoria, um, and thank you very much, Minister, for, for your presentation. Um, I, I, I think there are two things to commend uh, Victoria for uh, Victoria the state and, um, uh, and, and, and Lily's leadership. Um, one is the, the, the Climate Act, Victoria's Climate Act, which, is, which takes the responsibility for reducing emissions um, and makes it not just Lily's responsibility, but a whole of government approach in everything that government does. It needs to evaluate that against the legislative targets. So big credit for Victoria getting that legislation in place and making it, you know, it, we're, we're, we're through a full cycle of, of that legislation of tightening up the targets. And so hats off to Victoria uh, for the leadership there and leadership which other states have, in fact, all, um, all have followed to some degree. Victoria has, has the legislation, um, but every state has at least the ambition, which, which is fantastic. So effectively we have a net zero target in Australia, just the, the federal government being wagged by uh, uh, the, the, um, uh, the, the Barnaby, Barnaby's wagging the, wagging the federal government on that. Um, uh, yeah, we, we're in this ridiculous situation. But the, the other thing that Victoria, I think, needs, uh, um, uh, you know, Lily's government needs to be congratulated for is staying the course. You know, it, when, um, when Hazelwood closed, uh, which was not a decision of government, it must be remembered. It was a decision of Anji, the, the, the owner, uh, who gave a ridiculously short notice uh, for that. Uh, certainly not, not, not enough time for the community to adjust, not enough time for the market to adjust. And it was a tough time for the energy sector. It was a tough time for Victoria. And the, the political pressure on the government to back down um, from whatever it was doing was was intense, and they and they stuck with it. Um, so uh, that's 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 to be commended. We are, um, but we are we are we still have a long way to go on this on this journey. It's it's yeah you know, we we're, we've got another nine years before we hit that twenty thirty uh, or before before we approach that twenty thirty target. Um, the state government has just uh, uh, increased that. To, um, to a level that is commensurate with our trading partners, which is fantastic. I think it's the kind of leadership we, we, we need, um, but we've got a long way to go. And we do start from having the dirtiest grid in Australia. We have um, uh, three very large coal power stations in, uh, in, in um, uh, the Latrobe Valley, which are burning the dirtiest coal uh, in Australia, perhaps some of the dirtiest in the world. So we've got a big challenge uh, as, as we go ahead, but hats off to the government for just head down uh, and it's not focusing just on the electricity sector, but the, um, the, the significant moves on uh, bringing in heat pumps and uh, reverse cycle air conditioning as part of a transition away from gas in the home. Um, these, these are big steps. So hats off to the government for that and for showing uh, leadership at the subnational level, uh, which, which is um, you know, going, going, really putting our federal government to shame. Just picking up on this theme then of energy in Victoria, and, and Simon, you mentioned the coal-fired power stations. Minister, we know that this is going to be one of the big challenges for Victoria, is this transition away from coal. It's inevitable, it's coming, it's already happening, but we don't seem to have a clear plan for full coal closure in Victoria. And in fact, uh, it does feel like the, the energy companies are pulling the strings when we know the scale of the impact that's going to happen for communities here. What would it take to get a really clear closure timeline for coal in Victoria? Look, there are a number of ways you, you can get the same outcomes, really. So it, it's it's about, uh, and, and if you have a look at, um, uh, and, and uh, Simon quite rightly talked about Hazelwood and how that happened, uh, and no one really wants to see a repeat of that because it, it's not good for communities, it's not good for local communities, not good for transition, and it's not good for businesses that are thinking, should I invest or not? Uh, and then suddenly there's a, you know, what is it, a 
2,000 megawatt power station that's not going to be there in a year's time or six months' time. It's just crazy. So not not it needs to be well planned. So certainly uh, we we get that. Uh, uh, and uh, and as I said, I mean the Energy Australia arrangement uh, is one that um, uh, has that coming out uh, four years earlier, uh, giving uh, sufficient time for the market to actually respond by creating new uh, replacement power. But we also got to remember that. We can't turn off a tap uh, when uh, there are a number of things that have got to be built around where the new resources are, are going to be located. So transmission, I mentioned that earlier. Uh, our system, unfortunately, takes many years to deliver major transmission infrastructure projects uh, and, uh, and, 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 and work is underway to, to get the necessary uh, improvements uh, in place. I understand what you're saying about, well, you know, shouldn't all this be planned out? Shouldn't everyone know when X is, how long X is going to stay in, which one will go first and all that. I, I get that. Um, but, you know, we're, we're living in a situation where we're still able to achieve significant uh, increase in renewable energy in our state. Uh, we keep plowing on, setting our ambitious targets for 2030. And, you know, we'll, we're considering further what we do after that, of course. Uh, and, you um, and uh, I really do point to the Energy Australia uh, arrangement that that really is, is is wouldn't be bad as a model really to be uh, understood by uh, other jurisdictions in terms of how to do this. So um, yeah, so there's not much more I can say um, uh, beyond that. But um, there are many ways that you can address this. Simon, you're just on mute. Sorry, Victoria, can I say, I think we, we're still at the stage where it's politically very difficult to talk about coal closures. Uh, and I hope we can move past that soon. I acknowledge, I acknowledge, that, it's, I acknowledge that it's difficult, but we, we have to see those coal power assets uh, shut down probably by 2030 in order for Australia to, um, to, to meet its commitments. Um, uh, and we hopefully will be in a you know, start moving to an environment where those community and the asset owners um, uh, and, the and the and the energy and environment minister will all be on the same page there. But it's it's a very it's 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 a very challenging environment. One of the one of the issues. Um, let me give you an, give you an example. Is energy analysts uh, pretty widely believe that your lawn was going to start closing down units or dropping units. Um, over the next three or four years, um, but Energy Australia refused to acknowledge that publicly and announced, and they maintained that the power station would stay, your lawn would stay open until 2032, and and they wouldn't budge in the public sphere on that. Um, so when some of us, some of, when we look at a closure date of 2028 for your lawn, some of us see that as four years early, others of us see that as four years postponement of the closure. Um, regardless, it's sitting there in the, you know, the, the back half of the decade and there are two other major power stations that are going to need to close. But at the moment, there is great uncertainty amongst the workers, uh, the uh, energy investors, um, and, um, uh, and, and unfortunately, uh, until we've got business community and uh, government um, on the same page as to that closure uh, timeline. And I think that will, that will happen as the discussion shifts. But until that point, we, um, th you know, there is a big question mark uh, over Victoria's energy transition. I was um, pretty excited to hear, Minister, you talking about the not just the new jobs that are being created by renewable energy, um, but the jobs in Geelong, not too far down the road from me, that's that's from new investment coming back into regional areas. And I've, I think when we look at what this transition looks like, it's actually, it's a boom for investment in renewables, that the opportunity is huge, the regional opportunities are huge. And I was also kind of excited to hear you talking about recognising the challenge of gas and seeing the need to move away from gas. Um, I'll be very keen to see that gas substitution roadmap. But it does, and I'll say this as someone sitting down here in the Otways, um, flag a few questions around why new uh, drilling has just been approved for, for gas in the uh, just off from the Otways here down at the 12 Apostles, when this feels like exactly the wrong direction uh, in compared to everything else that, that you're talking about the government has planned. Yeah, look, I, I understand that, that question, Victoria, and, and a number of people have, have 
you know, said, well, you know, <laughs> I, I get that. I, I get that uh, that sense. Um, what, what I do want, what, what I would say to that, I mean, people will choose for themselves, you know, how they wish to react to that uh, and, and judge the government uh, accordingly. Um, but what I would say is that you, you've really got to look at the entirety of, the, of what a government is deciding needs to happen. Um, I want to say to you, and I will say to you, that our actual total, um, in terms of volume of, of gas consumption, has actually decreased, even though our population has gone up. Now, there's a lot of reasons for that. One of them, of course, is a really significant drive for energy efficiency, greater insulation of homes and the rest. And there's a lot of, you know, there are government programs that I can point you to that have been initiated by, by our government that has, has driven that. And of course, improvements to new build, new, new housing stock and the like. Um, the, the, uh, the issue of uh, decarbonisation of the gas issue, I'm really clear to everyone here, uh, that uh, the aim is to reduce, find solutions for gas. Now, uh, I did use the phrase earlier that you just can't turn off a tap overnight, and I'm not suggesting that's what you're saying, but what I do want to point you to is the fact that you really do need to consider uh, the, the, the broader range, the broad uh, range of government effort to get us to a particular point. Uh, and ultimately, it's that net point by 2030 uh, that is squarely in my mind uh, uh, in terms of identifying uh, alternatives to gas. Uh, and that's why we're the only state to be developing up a gas substitution roadmap. And, and if anyone has had an opportunity to have a look at that roadmap, we are deadly serious about this. Uh, now, of course, we have to uh, conclude that work. Uh, and then, of course, comes uh, the, the clear uh, additional policies that we need to implement to move our reliance uh, off gas onto uh, alternative forms of um, power, fuel, supply, etc. So that's what I would say to that. It won't satisfy everyone. I'm not here to argue that, uh, you know, people's positions are wrong on it, but uh, I think it is important not to say that uh, you know, you don't have any credible uh, climate change agenda because you're doing X. Well, I would say that's wrong. And that's the evidence tells you the opposite. Simon, where do you see this fitting into the debate about our energy mix and, and how fast we can and can't be moving? Uh, th thanks for that. Um, so uh, Victoria, is, is our use of gas is quite... Um, uh, it might surprise quite, quite a few people that in the electricity sector, we use very little gas. Only 2% of Victoria's electricity comes from, um, from gas power generation. So it's, it's really a very small part. Um, and as we, as we start switching on uh, batteries, like the, Victoria's big battery, I believe, is in testing right now. Uh, which, you know, which is the largest battery in Australia. It's, it's totally dwarfed the, uh, the, the battery in, in South Australia. Um, as we have more batteries and, and, and maybe we'll get a pumped hydro project uh, going, going in Victoria, we'll start seeing even, even that 2% will come down significantly. On the flip side though, half of the gas that is burnt in Australian homes is burnt in Victorian homes. We, uh, you know, when we opened up Bass Strait, was that in the I think in the 70s uh, and we found um, masses amount of, of waste gas and Victoria saw that as an opportunity to reticulate to houses around the state uh, and we, we heat our homes and uh, heat our water uh, with gas far in excess of any other state. Um, so it is very significant that the Victorian government is has a gas substitution roadmap. Um, uh, I, you know, it's it's actually quite brave to tell you know to have a document out there telling the gas industry um, you know we are you know, having a, a government approach to weaning ourselves off your product. You know, no one's managed to have a coal substitution roadmap in any jurisdiction in Australia. So hats off to the government for that. But uh, I'm with the large number of Victorians scratching their heads as to why we would open up new gas fields or you know do anything that makes it easy to extract gas when we know that we are moving off gas. Move us um, on to another just trans uh, energy related issue which is transport which is a, has been a growing area of emissions across Australia um, which seems crazy at a time when we know that the solutions are increasingly available. Um, I'm going to throw this to Simon first 
what is the opportunity here for, for electric vehicles in Victoria and for clean transport, public transport, other, other transport solutions? And, and why aren't we seeing that a response on this more rapidly uh, it feels like it's been just sort of the poor cousin of the energy debate for a long time mm. yes and transport is the next biggest sector after electricity uh, so it's, it is it is nationally i assume it's close to that uh, at the state level um, so it is it is the next bit of low-hanging fruit for us to pick um, uh, i remember years ago hearing rob gel uh, you know one of the early climate warriors in, uh, you know, spoke with so many, he spoke to so many town halls uh, meetings like this, imploring climate action 15 years ago. And he made the case that, um, uh, he made the case about electrifying everything. And, and then Victoria had a, had a bit of a jump on the rest of the country in that we, um, you know, trams have been electrified for a hundred years, uh, our trains, um, uh, you know, especially in our, in our urban areas, are, are, are significant. You know, I think in our urban areas, they're all electrified. So we have electrified significant amounts of, of um, transport. Um, there's a lot more to be done in the passenger um, uh, vehicle fleet. Um, Australia is very much behind uh, on, on electric vehicle um, adoption. You know, countries, I think China last year was 5% of new vehicles sold there were electric. Um, it was, um, I think, 0.75 in, in Australia. We are way behind. Um, now, the, 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 the minister and many others know that I was very disappointed that Victoria put a, uh, a tax on electric vehicles, um, I think, at a, at a, at a really uh, critical stage in the adoption of vehicles. Victoria became the first jurisdiction in the world with a net disincentive um, on electric vehicles. So I have a beef on that timing, but... There is a focus from the government on building the charging infrastructure. Um, there is a very limited uh, subsidy scheme that makes electric vehicles more affordable for Victorians. It'll run out only after a year and a half or so. Um, I really hope the government sees the merits in extending that. And there's lots they can do with, uh, with vehicle duties, um, uh, with registration fees, et cetera, that can help make, make sure that you know, most Victorians want their most Victorians who have a car want their next car to be electric. Um, and uh, I think there's a real role for government to shift the incentives to make it easier to go electric so we can start reducing those emissions uh, in that sector now. So some good things on the board, um, uh, some swings and roundabouts, but really it's, uh, it's got to be the real focus of this decade because you put a, you put a car on the road, um, a petrol car, it'll stay on the road for the next 20 years. Uh, polluting. So we want to, we want, we need this transition to go very quickly because they're long lived assets. Minister, I heard you note earlier that this is an area that, that you see an opportunity for a lot more work in, in years to come. But as, as you know, I said earlier, it does feel like this is constantly dragging and, and the poor cousin to a, to another part of the debate, yet it is so important and and transformational and structural how how can the victorian government speed this along and what what's holding you back from doing that yeah. no, no, look absolutely <clears throat> and certainly very much agree with simon that you know we need a massive you know massive step change uh, in transport in 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 all just jurisdictions absolutely look we have set ourselves uh, an ambitious target now uh, in terms of, you know, half of all new sales by 2030 need to be um, CDVs. Um, and, and the offering that we announced um, a few months ago, yes, there were some rebates uh, for a period of time, not, not a very long time, uh, but a number of initiatives that we've already announced, you know, charging infrastructure, so I'm pointing out, but it was never going to be uh, the only effort that that is, is going to get us to where we need to go by 2030, absolutely not. That's why we've got a, a, an expert panel that we have established. They're due to report to government uh, by the end of this year, all going well. Uh, and that's where we anticipate uh, other uh, uh, recommendations uh, are made to government to get us to, um, well, to, to be able to get us to where our commitments say we need to get to by 2030. Absolutely, it's gonna take big effort. Uh, there's a whole range of things that we need to incentivize. I mean, Simon, it's quite right. When you buy a car, it's in, it's in the system. Uh, whether you own it for five years or, or 15 years, someone owns it because it's not going to go on the scrap heap. 
uh, in five years. It's there for a long, long time. Um, and, um, and so there are a number of ways of uh, speeding up. So for example, what happens with private fleet? Because we know that with private or government fleet, we know that they don't keep cars for a long time. But if, uh, but when, uh, so, so it makes sense that, you know, if you've got more effort on, not just only effort, but let's say you up the effort on whether it's government fleet or private fleet, because of the turnover of, of vehicles, you actually then start to drive uh, in a short, relatively short period of time, a secondhand market, which then gets people into these cars and then it just then kicks it along in terms of the demand. That's a really important feature because sometimes when people think, oh, government fleet or private fleet, they just think of the total numbers. It's not the total numbers because obviously that doesn't represent everybody who lives in the, in the country or in the state, but it's the fact that the turnover is very uh, is a very short period of time, and you then stimulate the rest of the market. Really important. So we so so we'll see what the panel comes back to us on. What happens with rebates? We know that. What well, I mean, my view is that uh, there probably there will need to be an ongoing support, whatever that support looks like for the ordinary person out there to be able to make that choice of um, internal combustion engine versus uh, ZEV, uh, and. It, 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 there's an, we need to develop a way of actually getting those cheaper CDVs into our market because at the moment you can buy what, a car for $20,000. There is no car, I don't think, in, in Australia that is CDV that, that, that costs that much or anywhere near it. I think the cheapest is probably around $40,000. Uh, and these are, these are the real decision port, critical decisions that people are confronted by, you know. So um, that's a big area that we need to crack. Um, Simon, you took yourself back off mute then. Were you about to jump back in? <laughs> no, not, not at that moment, but, but I will right now and just underscore that that is very important, stimulating that secondhand market. Um, uh, the, the ACT was probably the first uh, jurisdiction in Australia to have a strong uh, vehicle, um, electric vehicle policy. One of the things they, they did is um, to, uh, committed to transition their whole government fleet there uh, to EVs over a three-year period. Um, so it's already two-thirds of, uh, of the government fleet there are EVs. And next year, the first, of the, the first crop of ACT government EVs will enter the second-hand market. So you will have the $20,000 uh, cars in the EV market and you, um, uh, they'll be low, low kilometres uh, and they'll be affordable. And so we'll start to see a demographic shift of who owns electric vehicles. Um, so very important. Well, one, one thing that you know, when I started looking into you know, researching this field, I was stunned to learn that um, slightly more than 50% of all vehicles in Australia go to fleets. Um, we, we are an, a nation of uh, car fleet, your company cars, government, um, commercial. And um, the, you know, for, most, for most Australians, their car will be an ex-fleet purchase. So we need to get these vehicles into fleets. And fleets understand, you know, um, they understand the total cost of ownership of, of a vehicle. So we're at the point now where the cheapest EV costs about the same as like, the, the lowest cost um, uh, Hyundai, uh, is it the Kona, uh, costs about the same as a Toyota Camry over a four-year period. But householders don't make their investment decisions on total cost of ownership. They really feel the upfront cost. Um, so it's a brilliant move to encourage fleets to transition as quickly as possible to EVs. Uh, while, uh, and that, that not only will bring more models into Australia, will bring the cost down, but it will make them accessible for more Victorians. I have been keeping an eye on the chat as we and the and the questions. We've got a lot of them. Um, I think actually most people will be relieved to know we're not going to deal with all of those seventy odd questions that are coming through tonight. Uh, but we will pass any that we don't get to on. Um, but I'm going to move us on because the top questions that are coming through, um, Minister, you've come to a discussion around climate and environment. I don't think it's going to surprise you to hear that we are hearing about trees, 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 and trees. Um, um, there's a note here that Victoria's remaining ash forests are the best in the world at storing carbon. The decision to stop logging them was made in 2019 and since then Victoria's forests have been devastated by bushfires. Over 200 rare or threatened species have lost half of their habitat. Will you please stop logging native forests by 
2025. And I believe that initial commitment was was quite some time away, 2030, uh, if I'm not correct. So what again, this is a this is an emergency situation for the climate. It's an emergency situation for biodiversity. Uh, what's stopping that from coming forward? Uh, yeah, look, I, I understand um, people's sentiments around this uh, and, and, I, and I hear it a lot, absolutely. Uh, what I will say to you is that um, there were a number of considerations that we, need to, we needed to balance out when we made the decision that we uh, arrived at, going back to 2019. Uh, some things that were part of sort of legacy contracts and legislation, um, and I'm not putting these out there as excuses. All I'm saying is that there are a number of considerations that, that uh, led to the decision that uh, we made. Uh, and, and of course, jobs is, is one of those. Um, uh, and of course, I understand uh, that um, the biodiversity crunch, uh, especially in the light of uh, bushfires um, that we had, they were very devastating across the uh, Eastern seaboard. Um, what I will say to you is that um, uh, the decision that we made around that uh, there is a step down. I know it's not what people are asking for, but, but there is a, a step down in terms of uh, harvesting or logging uh, in that 2024 period, I think it is. And then finally, of course, the exit in 2030. Uh, we believe that that, that is the, the, the combination of um, matters that we needed to balance out, including uh, significant jobs. Uh, existing contracts uh, around timber supply, uh, which are long-term contracts that were locked away for a long time ago, um, together with uh, doing the most that we can in terms of uh, biodiversity and, and uh, easing our way out of uh, uh, logging, uh, resulted in the decision that we made. Um, now, I know that it's, it doesn't make a lot of people happy, um, but I will say to you, we are getting out of it by 2030. I know we had the devastating bushfires. Uh, I will say to you that um, I do want, I would, I would like to think that people consider the, the full efforts that we're taking when it comes to climate change, because the, the biggest threat to our biodiversity loss and, and decline right, globally has been climate change. And that's not to take away anything about housing. I'm not, I'm, please don't misunderstand what I'm saying here. But what I will say is that um, our efforts, I mean, I, I sometimes read, you know, unless you deal with uh, logging, you're not serious about climate change. Well, I really have to beg to differ. Uh, I really do. Now, um, you know, um, could some people make an argument that we should get out sooner? Of course, people can make that argument. I get that. But to conclude that, unless it's that element of your climate change effort, then nothing else matters. I'm just sorry, but I'm just gonna to have to disagree. Um, so, but I know it, it, it's a, a very uh, strong argument. Uh, people have very strong views on this. Uh, what I will say, and I'll continue to say is that we landed on a set of decisions that had to balance a number of um, issues that were uh, important uh, across a range of communities. Minister, it's not the only um, biodiversity crisis sort of issue that's that's live at the moment. And last week, I couldn't help but notice an article in the Age newspaper about the dire state of biodiversity in Victoria, noting over 2,000 species are currently threatened in Victoria, and that there's been quite a significant underinvestment in the support for threatened and endangered species. What can your government or what will your government be planning to do around this to bring Victoria's species back from the brink of extinction? Mm. No, thank you. Uh, yes, certainly there was, uh, as uh, the um, Auditor General does uh, its reviews in terms, in terms of number of programs. So this was one that they'd had underway for a while. Um, in terms of, um, uh, uh, sorry, uh, I'm not sure exactly how you phrase a uh, decrease in investment. It may not have been that word, but we've actually, and, and is it enough? The answer is no. So I'll answer that question first. But uh, but but we we are actually putting record amount more than any other government has ever done in environment and biodiversity. Is it enough? And I've already answered that. No, we need to do more. Absolutely. We did set ourselves very strong ambition uh, on biodiverse, in biodiversity when we uh uh, released our biodiversity 2037 plan uh, and we set ourselves some targets uh, 
and uh, and of course, you know, we need to uh, do more. And I'm hoping that we can do a lot more uh, to get us as close as possible to meeting those targets if actually not meeting them. We've set those targets. My intention is to, to, to meet those. Um, so yes, we need a, a lot more investment, a lot more. Uh, and certainly we've accepted all the recommendations uh, of uh, the Vega report uh, and, uh, and, and more work is underway. I've noticed in the chat, there's also quite a number of uh, either discussions in the chat or questions in the, in the Q&A around households. And one question that's come in is noting that household um, behaviour changes, switching air conditioning into um, space, space heaters and um, a whole range of household changes could actually make quite a significant change to uh, energy use and to efficiency. Um, I know Australian and Victorian houses are incredibly leaky. Um, what more can the government do? And this particular question is asking, could the government somehow advertise or think about other mechanisms to address the, the crisis of, our, of the state of our housing, really? Yeah, yeah. Oh, and, and, and that's that's an ongoing, um, how can I put it, program of work, because, you know, we've got, you know, however millions of houses that have been built, more than a million, and we know, I think the... A and, and there may be an updated report on this, but you know, I think on average, uh, Victoria, not dissimilar to Australia, but Victoria's housing stock is rated like around two two stars. <laughs> you know, uh, that's right. Yeah, really, really poor. Um, and there's a lot that has to be done to lift those standards. Look, um, Minister uh, responsible for residential tenancies. You know, legislation there. You know, there's been some changes made to. Uh, uh, the rights of tenants to have uh, 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 minimum standards in terms of energy efficiency, um, and 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 I'm very confident that she'll she's got a work stream, and and you know there's been a couple iterations thus far, and hopefully some more will, will come. I know she's very committed to that. Uh, it's 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 a big slog because we're talking about. I mean, there are there are some initiatives that can can be very effective and very cheap, but then there are a lot of big steps to actually get to your, your, your five or your six or your seven stars that, that are, are far more expensive and taking that big step in terms of retrofitting is not an easy thing to do. So, but um, we keep putting in more effort, absolutely. You know, we've upped um, the targets for our Victorian Energy Upgrades Program, uh, like targets in terms of we want to abate more emissions. So when we increase those targets, we drive further activities in terms of energy efficiency upgrades in homes and, and businesses. So that's that scheme there. It's the most comprehensive scheme of its type in the country. Um, but of course, the home heating and cooling program, you know, uh, 200,000 of those are, are going in. Uh, uh, Richard Wynne's got um, sort of a special uh, fund for energy efficiency, including uh, heating upgrades too for social housing, public housing. Um, a lot of effort needs to be made here. Uh, we are doing it. A lot more needs to be done, absolutely. Uh, but unfortunately, Australia's housing stock is terribly, terribly poor. Minister, I heard you note earlier that um, you, you are seeing the each budget coming up as an opportunity to go further. So I'm assuming all the transport advocates, the energy efficiency advocates uh, will be really mapping out the pathway to, to, to budget time. So uh, I expect them to be knocking at your door. It, I'm going to take a little forward. bit of a facilitator <laughs> license to ask a question that is of particular interest to me um, and would be remiss in my role as uh, working with Women's Environmental Leadership Australia not to ask. Um, I want to have a, just a really quick chat about the gender aspects of how we are addressing our, our climate and biodiversity crises. The evidence is really clear that more women in decision-making positions equals better environmental outcomes. And a study was done of in over 130 countries, those places that had more women elected actually had better environmental decisions made. You're obviously in a, um, Australian politics is not known for its gender friendliness uh, generally. Um, you've, you've stepped forward and put your hand up to, to lead and be active in this space. What more can we do to support women to lead for our climate and biodiversity in the ways that work for them across sectors? Yeah, well, yeah, no, it's a really great question. And I'm, I'm, I like the way you sort of brought these 
things together. Um, I can certainly point to the fact that we've got very strong target uh, that half of uh, uh, government board appointments uh, need to be women. Uh, and we're, we're you know, meeting those targets. That's one, uh, because it's about decision making right across government and thinking about climate change, keep thinking about um, uh, how it intersects with all of government and how it operates, really important. Uh, and um, the uh, other matters uh, go to, <laughs> I'll give you, if I can, just, just a, a tangible example of how, just to dis, uh, help to exemplify the point that you're making about when m women are in decisions, you know, that better outcomes uh, are had in climate change. So, I was at, um, and please bear with me, but I was at a, an opening of a new disability service in my electorate about three years ago, and it was uh, respite care. Um, had nothing to do with my portfolios. You know, I was there, I was a local MP, and I was speaking to a mother, a, a carer, a mother of one of the um, uh, people, the clients who was going to utilise the, the service for respite, and and you can think, you know, geez, you know, the weight of the world is on a parent or a carer, you know. She turned around to me and said, I, you know, I was not there to talk about my portfolios. Of course I wouldn't. Why would I? But she turns around to me and says, oh, and by the way, what on earth is, this is back in Tony Abbott's, what on earth is that man doing about climate change? Now, you know, these things matter to people. It resonates. Uh, when you have a think about the impacts of climate change, uh, and, and, and people's sense of security and the future for the kids or grandkids, it matters, of course it does. And who are most, who, and who, and mostly caring comes from women. Uh, uh, we need more men to do it, of course, you know, maybe that, that might actually help with the climate change debate. Um, but, um, but yeah, you're right, absolutely. What more can we do? Definitely listen more to women uh, and don't, and, 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 uh, and, and, and people care about a multitude of things uh, in their lives. Uh, and we pigeonholing people and treating people uh, through one dimensional view about how you deliver policy and outcomes uh, does everyone ultimately a disservice. Yeah, I, I, I couldn't agree more. And certainly I think one of the questions we're looking at is where where is the role of the care economy, of teaching, of education, of really female dominated workspaces in this massive transition that we're going through? Um, there's a there's a really important leadership role for, for women in those in those dominant spaces to play as well. I'll move us, um, I'm just aware of the time, so our final question, and I guess looking to the future and thinking really big picture about, about the challenges that we face, but also the opportunities before us, there's, the opportunity is massive. The, the scale of indus, industry will change across all sectors is quite significant. How is Victoria positioning to take advantage of those and to really Think about the big future investment opportunities. We're very active in the energy space, but we're not necessarily seeing some of the really big, um, big projects, big thinking, big strategies that, that could shape the economy and, and our future and society for decades to come. So where are we positioned there? Um, I might be to differ through one prism only, but I get it. it's not just about energy. Absolutely. Think about what what helped create Victoria as the the, the what was for a long time it still is but it looks different as the manufacturing hub of the country. A number of things came together. One is you know interventionist governments going back more than a hundred years, but you also had uh, whether people like it or not an abundance of dirt cheap power. Okay, from the valley, that's what created those two things uh, that created. Um, the economy, uh, the, the, the strength of our economy and manufacturing and, and the prosperity that comes through that. However, unequally, sometimes, you know, it, it can look and, and is in, in many respects. So I don't want to ignore that. So, uh, so conversely, uh, the quicker we change that energy profile, uh, the, the better off we will be potentially as first movers uh, in terms of economic benefits. And when you couple that with projects that you help to uh, support and drive by having requirements of local content, you're developing up your supply chain, you're developing up the need for really big investment for skills development, which is what Galtini is doing. I mean, you only have to look at the last budget 
and the massive amounts of money that she's uh, been able to achieve uh, to put in for skills development in new energy technologies uh, is quite astounding. And Victoria's doing that. So, so that's that. But in terms of the big projects, um, look, offshore wind is going to be massive, absolutely, uh, for us. And um, I'm hoping, you know, I can, I'll be able to say more on that um, sometime soon. Uh, the transport, uh, so, so that's really, really critical for us. Where hydrogen sits in all of this, the big challenge for us is how do we, uh, as I said, decarbonise that gas system replace it with you know uh, to an extent electrification as I mentioned but then you've got renewable hydrogen which you know I'm absolutely committed to um, uh, and and what what are the sort of early areas that we can actually make that substitution um, heavy vehicles is really important because um, the economics of of hydrogen makes absolute sense now uh, in terms of the heavy transport heavy vehicle transport uh, area, uh, uh, other, other um, and, and so that, that's, that's, they're the next big, and you can see that there's a race, you know, a race developed up in, uh, across the jurisdictions in, in uh, Australia on, on that, and we'll have more to say on that ourselves. So they're the big things. Now, transport has to absolutely be um, a massive uh, shift, absolutely, uh, and that has to be transformative. Um, Simon said 2030, yeah, it has to be trans really absolutely transformative by then. And it has to be really clear signals about where we're going to land totally on the transport emissions fix. We need to know and, and be on that road uh, and, and on our way there well and truly uh, by that 2030 date. Um, the, democratize the democratization of the energy system is something that I've always been very passionate about. Uh, and it's about that fairness, uh, accessibility, um, and, uh, and the accessibility in terms of people having uh, the opportunity to all get the benefits of the transformation that is really critical to the success of any economy to transition and transition well. Uh, and, and, and early movers always get the benefits when they do that well. Uh, that is, uh, and, and that's exactly what I want Victoria to remain in that position and taking communities with us is really important. Thank you, Minister. Thank you for your comments tonight. And Simon, I'll just pass to you for a, a final comment on that, on that point. That the energy democratization point that, that oh. the minister made was I, fascinating. I, I, you can you can respond to that if you would like, or to the question about where the big opportunities and future investments are. However, you want choose to respond. Sure. Well, we're still we're still um, more than two thirds, or just on two thirds of our electricity comes from brown coal. So we have made you know Victoria led Australia with um, with the Renew Victorian renewable energy target um, back in uh, the Brumby days uh, and. Uh, then there's the VRET uh, in, um, uh, it's now, in this, there's a, there's a, there was a, another round four or so years ago, and there's another round open at the moment. So Victoria is making great inroads, but we've got so far to go uh, on, on the electricity front. On, on the transport front, a lot of the moves to decarbonise transport end up um, making our cities more livable. So focus on, uh, fo focus on, uh, more public transport, uh, and then of the cars that remain, making them quieter and cleaner, uh, making our cities more um, accessible by bicycle and on foot. All of these go to better quality of, of, of life as we are addressing um, the climate challenge. Um, uh, we, we are blessed in this country to, you know, we, 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 it seemed crazy at the time when we had coal at one end of the state to go put an aluminium smelter at the other. There were great political reasons why that happened, but they did not very good technical reasons at the time. But what it did leave us with as a legacy is a great big backbone through the state that the other states, uh, other states would kill for such a strong electricity backbone that runs straight through the states. And we have been plugging renewables into that all the way along. Uh, and it sets up Portland for uh, for the future. So, you know, I'm hoping we start seeing a, um, 
uh, a, a renewable energy or zero carbon investment boom in that part of the state. They've got this lifeline or this backbone to uh, um, there at one end. There's a lot of that part of the state where there are stranded assets, you know, like, so wind assets that um, uh, or opportunities rather that haven't yet been exploited uh, that could help us push out the brown coal from our grid. Um, and uh, I think we've still got a way to go to work out what hydrogen means for Victoria, um, but certainly we've got access, um, the ability to at least to, to um, generate the cheap electricity that makes hydrogen make sense. So looking forward to seeing how uh, Lily and her government embrace this challenge and move us from having one of the dirtiest uh, uh, grids and dirtiest economies in Australia and, and therefore in the Western world um, to uh, to one of the cleanest. So very much looking forward to that that transition. Can I add one little one other thing, which is really important. Thank you. And just on that, uh, just an extension to some of what Sonia said, is that because Victoria has been and remains a net exporter of our power, cleaning up our energy system actually helps other states' emissions too, as the end users of it. So that's really important. <laughs> That's a, that's a really Not good taking point. Anything away from no, that's, that's a really good, really but, good but it point. Is really, we, we can't count them in Victoria, but others. No, no, I, I, I care about that because um, <laughs> it's fascinating watching South, South Australia is decarbonizing at an incredible rate. Um, mm. uh, but still, about 10%, maybe even less, I might be overcooking that. Still, some of its power comes from Victoria. But when, and, and when you look at um, South Australia's emissions, <laughs> their electricity emissions um, very significantly are coming from that uh, emissions that would come, you know, notionally come over the interconnector. So as Victoria cleans up very much, we start seeing, uh, it, you know, improves South Australia's cleanliness, I guess, of their grid. Um, Tasmania, I know when they connected Tasmania with the Bass Link across to Victoria, a lot of people in Tassie were really upset that where they would be importing this brown coal power from, um, from Victoria. So. As Victoria cleans up, you're going to make a lot of people in South Australia, Tasmania and New South Wales happy. Yeah. <laughs> I'm, I'm going to close us there. Thank you very much, um, Simon. Thank you, Minister, for being here, for being open to such a broad and, and big discussion with us. We really appreciate it. If you, as the audience, like what you have heard from the Minister today, you will find her in Parliament, uh, where she <laughs> will be for until the next election, and then you guys get to make choices. So pay attention, get on in and support. Uh, and drive stronger action. You've already heard what was said about next year's budget. There's your opportunity. Um, if you like what you heard from Simon, you can catch him tomorrow night on the ABC's Q&A. What a promo uh, and what an audience. So there is definitely another opportunity to hear more of Simon's insights to what's happening uh, in Australia on the energy space. And if you are interested in supporting more women's leadership for our environment, then come and find us over at Weller at Women's Environmental Leadership Australia. And I'm gonna hand over to close to Lynn Franks, who's one of the co-conveners of Lighter Footprints. And I'm doing that with an enormous thanks from me uh, as well for the excellent work of Lighter Footprints in bringing us all together. Thanks very much, Victoria. Um, and thank you to all of our um, speakers, to Lily and to Simon. Uh, it's been a really um, wide ranging evening and um, it's after nine, so I'm just gonna be quick. Um, I just wanna say that we would much rather be uh, sending the nation of Victoria to COP than sending the feds, but unfortunately that's where we're at. And the other thing I wanna hold on to is something that Lily said early in the evening which is act with hope. And I think we all need, need to do that. So um, thank you very much, um, Minister, for giving us so generously of your time. Thank you, Simon, for adding the expertise and the probing questions and to Victoria for keeping it all on track and making it happen. Now we do have next steps, so we'd love you all to um, stay for this. I am going to tell you a little bit about the next events that Lotta Footprints has lined up, um, which we're hoping you will um, join in on. And I'm just going to see if I can share my screen to make that happen so that you can see what we're doing. And from the beginning. Okay, so um, we've got an event uh, coming up on the 3rd of November that we're hoping you um, will be interested in joining us. 
it is um, uh, information about um, solar that we have uh, joined up with Metropolitan Community Power Hub, which is an initiative of the Victorian government. So thank you very much, Lily. So we have um, managed to link in with uh, Yara Energy Foundation and we'll be having a presentation. So for people who are interested in getting solar, and want some help getting through the idea of who should you use and what should you have. Um, this takes all of those questions out of it for you. We've, we've got um, uh, experts coming to speak to you and we'll talk to you about the trusted suppliers that they use and the bulk buy kind of pricing that you can get. So that's on the 3rd of November, it's a Zoom and I'm hoping that the links for the RSVP will be put in the chat. We're quite excited about our relationship with the Metro Community Power Hub. So the next thing is um, our last formal meeting of the year, which is gonna be on the 27th of November. We're going to be meeting with our uh, local state MPs, um, John Kennedy, Will Fowles and Paul Hamer. They're gonna be reflecting on the year that's passed and speaking to us about what they hope for climate in 2022. Uh, Tim Smith was also invited to attend this evening. He hasn't responded and I'll let you take from that what you will. Um, just to point out that we've been running a climate targets campaign, um, lobbying the federal government to bring stronger targets to COP, which we're hoping you all would take part in. Um, and in particular, we'd also like you to do this community survey which is um, being organized by uh, Act on Climate. It's a, a sort of four minute survey and it's about uh, the COP targets and Friends of the Earth will be, and Act on Climate will be taking the results of that survey to our local federal members. Um, so if you live in Chisholm, Higgins or Kuyong, we encourage you to take this survey now. Uh, it only takes a few minutes and we, um, yeah, much appreciate you doing that. So that rounds out our year. And I just want to say thank you to the audience for coming tonight. I hope you found it a really interesting evening. I certainly did. Um, so good night. <laughs>